Welcome to This Week in Amateur Radio. We bring to you all the latest news in amateur radio and the wider world of communications. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1225 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Volunteer Monitoring Report returns, and this time we have the July edition. We will tell you who on the air has been good and who has been bad. ARIS announces simultaneous operation of the APRS and voice repeater systems on the space station. We will have all the details. HARP is hosting an open house this weekend at its facilities in Gakona, Alaska. The ARRL welcomes its new Director of Information Technology. We will introduce you to him. A federal court rules that the FCC can reallocate 5.9 gigahertz, effectively killing off V2X. That's vehicles to everything wireless. A noted technology publication calls the recently proposed new broadband minimum speeds by the FCC already obsolete. The annual simulated emergency test is coming up and you may want to consider running yours under the incident command system. And Researchers have discovered the key to making capacitors smaller. We will have this and a lot more coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT will bring us up to date on all the latest news in the world of science and technology, and he will take a quick look at what a time traveler from the 1950s would think about today's technology. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will take a close-up look at the amateur radio code, past and present. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of his summer series entitled Amateur Radio History Headlines. This week, Bill takes a look above the fold for what made amateur headlines during the early 1970s. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, puts aside his tools and climbing belt for part five of his six-part series at composing and successfully submitting a public service announcement to local broadcast media to promote your upcoming ham fest or club special event station. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny, hot, and humid Albany, New York, yeah, summer's return for a last hurrah, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the shack of K2MST inside the Museum of Science and Technology in Syracuse, New York, I'm your humble reporter, Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from the Western Catskills of upstate New York, where the summer continues unabated, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Trey New York News Bureau, where it's, yep, still hot, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where someone finally found a pin large enough to pop that high-pressure center that was camping out over us all summer, and we are enjoying the cooler temperatures. And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And man, the pop must have been impressive. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, the Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the July 2022 activity report of the Volunteer Monitor Program, courtesy of its administrator, Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH. Notices for unlicensed operation on two-meter amateur frequencies were sent to two logging companies in Kettle Falls, Washington State. 
Commendations were issued to amateurs in Poughkeepsie, New York for work in conducting the Community Daily Bulletin Board on the 146.97 MHz Mount Beacon repeater and in Rosalind, Pennsylvania for work with the Philmont Mobile Radio Club and involving the club in mesh and field day operations. A commendation was issued to an operator in Columbia, South Carolina for facilitating amateur involvement in the Richland County Emergency Operations Center and assisting amateurs in completing community emergency response team programs. A technician class operator in Martinez, California and a general class operator in Trenton, New Jersey were both issued notices for FT8 operation on 40 and 20 meter frequencies outside their license privileges. General class operators in Massapequa, New York and Trenton, New Jersey were issued notices for single sideband operation on 14.201 and 21.270 MHz. General class operators have no voice privileges below 14.225 and 21.275 MHz. An operator in Indian Hills, California received a notice for unlicensed operation on 144.390 MHz simplex APRS during a high altitude balloon operation. The FCC had canceled his license over a year before the flight. The final totals for VM monitoring during June 2022 were 1,676 hours on HF frequencies, 2,099 hours on VHF frequencies and above, for a total of 3,775 hours. Once again, we thank Volunteer Monitor Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this month's report. German National Amateur Radio Society, the DARC, reports that the broadcast station Telediffusion d'Algerie has been causing interference to the 21 MHz primary amateur radio band. It seems that Algerian radio is now broadcasting in the early evening hours on a frequency of 21450 kHz, with the lower sideband of its amplitude modulated signal encroaching into the 15 meter amateur band. Germany's Bandwatch organization has already involved their spectrum regulator, the German Federal Network Agency, better known as BNETSA, in order to try to effect a frequency change. Telediffusion d'Algerie recently attracted negative attention with its morning broadcasts on 7200 kHz. There too, the transmitted signal inevitably radiates into an exclusive amateur radio band with its lower sideband. This report was made by Daniel Muller, Delta Lima 3, Romeo Tango Lima, who is head of Germany's Bandwatch. ARIS, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, announced that simultaneous operations of the ARIS voice repeater and digital automatic packet reporting system, or APRS, communications on the space station is now a reality. John Ross, KD8 IDJ, has more in this report from League Headquarters. Current ARIS operations include voice repeater transmissions with the JVC Kenwood TMD710GA in the Columbus module and APRS operations from the identical uh, radio in the Cerveda service module. Packet operations are on 145.825 MHz. The Columbus module radio uses the call sign NA1SS and the new radio in the Cerveda module uses RS0ISS. Aside from the call signs, the radios are identical and packet operations are both the same as before. You can use RS0ISS, ARISS, or APRSAT as the packet path. Both radios are expected to be running full-time except during educational contacts, extravehicular activities, EVAs, and docking maneuvers. Final checkouts and equipment activation occurred on August 11th. Aris International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, said that simultaneous operation of APRS and the voice repeater on ISS is transformative for Aris. It represents a key element for our Aris 2.0 initiative, providing interactive capabilities 24-7 that inspire, engage, and educate youth and lifelong learners, especially lifelong learners in ham radio operations. Our heartfelt thanks to Sergei Serberov, RV3DR, for making this crucial ARIS 2.0 initiative become a reality. Meanwhile, Rosalie White, K1STO, one of two delegates to ARIS, said that the ham radio community will be very happy with the new radio operations from the ISS. She said that hams really love doing ARIS packet, crossband repeater, and slow scan TV operations. Besides the thousands who downloaded ARIS SSTV images downlinked from the ISS, we discovered that in a year's time, hams did 80,000 ARIS packet messages. 
We're not sure how many of them are enjoying the ARES crossband repeater yet, but we do know it is a lot. The simultaneous operation capability is going to make many hams happy, and we know that keeping hams on the air is good for ARRL and good for amateur radio. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The ARES Russia and USA teams have been working for several weeks to prepare the service module radio for APRS operations. ARES Russian team member Sergei Sambarov, RV3DR, led the effort, working with Russian mission controllers and the onboard ISS cosmonauts to configure the service module radio for APRS ops. On August 11th, final checkouts were completed and the APRS packet mod was switched on for amateur radio use. You can find operational status and expected downtimes of the ISS radios at www.ariss.org. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, or ARIS, is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the International Space Station. In the United States, sponsors are ARRL, the National Association of Amateur Radio, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, or AMSAT, the ISS National Lab Space Station Explorers, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, and NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program. The primary goal of ARIS is to promote exploration of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics topics. ARIS does this by organizing scheduled contacts via amateur radio between crew members aboard the ISS and students. Before and during these radio contacts, students, educators, parents, and communities take part in hands-on learning activities tied to space, space technologies, and amateur radio. MFJ Enterprises, an amateur radio electronics manufacturer and retailer, will celebrate 50 years in business this October. With more details on the upcoming anniversary of MFJ, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. Martin Jew, K5FUL, founded that company in 1972 after building a CW filter kit that sold for less than $10. Since 1990, the company has made five acquisitions, including high gain and Cushcraft antennas. MFJ customer service and public relations manager Richard Stubbs says the company continues to grow with the popularity of amateur radio and currently manufactures over 2,000 products. I've been with the company for 28 years and the numbers are good, said Stubbs. Amateur radio continues to grow worldwide. Quite a few of MSJ's employees have worked there for years, such as MFJ product representative Phyllis Randall, who will be retiring in September after 45 years with the company. She started working there as a teenager in 1977, and she is now the product representative for all MFJ dealers. Jew himself graduated from Mississippi State University with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and he earned a master's degree in electrical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology, also known as Georgia Tech. He served as a professor of electrical engineering at Mississippi State University from 1972 until 1979, but abandoned his doctorate in 1977 because of MFJ's growth. Currently, because of COVID-19 concerns, the company does not have any plans for a special event to celebrate the anniversary, although Stubbs said that that may change in the months ahead. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, better known as HARP, will host an open house at the facility in Ganoka, Alaska on August 27, 2022. John Ross, KD8 IDJ, has more in this report from League Headquarters. That event will offer an opportunity to learn how scientists study the Earth's ionosphere and provide a tour of the research facility as well. Amateur radio operators who attend can learn about how the ionosphere affects both long and short term range communications. The University of Alaska Fairbanks acquired HARP's research equipment from the United States Air Force in August of 2015, and their Geophysical Institute operates HARP under a cooperative research and development agreement. In 2021, the National Science Foundation awarded the UAF Geophysical Institute a five-year, $9.3 million grant for new research observation and observatory at HARP. UAF describes HARP as the world's most capable high-power, high-frequency transmitter for study of the ionosphere. Built in three phases starting in the early 1990s and continuing through 2007 at a cost of some $300 million, the 30-acre facility has 360 transmitters, 180 antennas, and five 
powerful generators. The open house runs from 9 to 3 p.m. on Saturday, August 27th, and will feature a 90-minute self-guided tour that will highlight the following. Harps Control Room, Science and History Displays, Power Plant with the five generators used during the research, and Transmitters and the 33-acre antenna array. Eventually, there will be a virtual tour of the HARP facility. More information about HARP and their open house is available on their Facebook page. The HARP facility attracts scientists from universities, government, and the private sector. Again, you can find out more details about the research facility on the HARP Facebook page. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, has announced the hiring of Steve Berry, N1EZ, into the new position of Director of Information Technology. He's from Bedford, New Hampshire, and has been a radio amateur for 45 years. For more details on the league's new IT director, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this special report from league headquarters. Barry began his 35-year IT career in software development with a wide range of environments from firmware to Unix device drivers and application development. While working for AT&T Bell Labs, now known as Nokia Bell Labs, as a network consultant, he built his first consulting firm focused on Unix, networking, and electronic publishing. After the acquisition of that firm, he worked in senior-level management positions within systems integration and consulting organizations before founding Stratford Technology in 1995. I'm pleased to welcome Steve into his new role at ARRL headquarters at CEO Dave Minster, NA2AA. The position and its responsibilities are key to helping us achieve ARRL's ongoing digital transformation for the benefit of our members. As Director of Information Technology, Barry is responsible for the overall strategic and operational IT functions, including continuous evaluation and execution of processes, systems, applications, and infrastructure. Barry manages a team of professional IT contributors, including a development team and project leaders. Together, they fulfill a variety of technology services for the organization, such as corporate databases and systems, websites and web services, service support, and coordinating outside suppliers of technology services and contracted resources. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Barry Strafford offered business intelligence consulting services and eventually focused on delivering enterprise performance management solutions to Fortune 500 organizations based on Oracle Hyperion technology. In 2012, Barry and his team built the first Oracle Hyperion managed application hosting service on the Amazon Web Services platform. Stafford was acquired by Apps Associates in 2020. I feel truly honored to give back to ARRL and the hobby. Both have done so much for me, especially with the many friends I have made over the years and the ham mentors who gave me a start in my career, said Barry. The long-running saga of the V2X, a vehicle to everything, a system that uses part of the wireless spectrum to allow vehicles to communicate with road infrastructure and each other, appears to be finally over. On Friday this week, a U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia ruled that the Federal Communications Commission can go through with its plan to free a part of the spectrum previously set aside for vehicles and infrastructure to talk to each other. Instead, that bandwidth will be turned over to Wi-Fi instead. The FCC set aside the 5.9 gigahertz band for the V2X back in 1999. A communications protocol that vehicles could use to alert each other to dangers sounded like a great idea at the time, and the plan was to use dedicated short-range radio communication wireless to power the system. Originally, the technology was meant to be fitted just to vehicles, but engineers got ambitious and decided that instead to just TV2V, vehicles should be able to talk to things like traffic lights as well. This would lead us into a traffic utopia, where congestions and crashes are things of the past. There was even thought given to making pedestrians dependent on DSRC to avoid being flattened by speeding cars. In 2020, the agency finally decided to reallocate the 45 megahertz from 5.850 to 5.9252 gigahertz. The band would be taken away from automakers and highway planners and given to Wi-Fi, which has actual users who need the bandwidth. The court denied the challenge to that reallocation by the Intelligent Transportation Society of America and the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, arguing that the court was unconvinced that sufficient advances had been made in V2V technology. 
The FCC told the court that 30 megahertz spectrum remained available for those so-called intelligent transportation systems, and the agency considered that enough. The FCC was happy with the outcome, and they're pleased with the court's decision, which upholds the FCC's broad authority to manage the nation's airwaves. It's more than two decades since the FCC allocated the 5.9 gigahertz band to support automobile safety. Autonomous and connected vehicles have largely moved beyond dedicated short-range communications to newer market-driven alternatives. Today's decision recognizes that by allowing this spectrum to evolve, we can advance to newer, safer technologies and grow the wireless economy. Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel recently proposed raising the minimum broadband speed requirements in the United States to 100 megabits per second for downloads and 20 megabits per second for uploads. The move was generally well received, but long overdue, at a time when median download and upload speeds among service providers in the United States still rank below several other nations. Still, Fiber Broadband Association President and CEO Gary Bolton said the FCC's ongoing focus on speed minimums is a misguided approach. Bolton told Fierce Telecom magazine via email, Our industry has moved beyond the speed test and is now focused on the experience test. We would encourage the FCC to not set new broadband definitions that are already obsolete, but to look forward to the future and establish definitions that will support the vision and innovation of the metaverse and beyond. They can do that with definitions that support symmetric speeds, single-digit latency requirements, and enable concurrency. He explained that these are the criteria that metaverse driver Meta, owner of Facebook, identified during a keynote speech at the Fiber Broadband Association's Fiber Connect 2022 conference in Nashville last month. As we look to the immediate future, we are at the early stages of the next version of the internet, the metaverse. Meta delivered a keynote that described their vision of the metaverse, and to fulfill that vision, they outlined three key criteria for the nation's broadband network. These criteria include symmetric bandwidth, being able to send as much information as you receive, low latency, significantly reducing the time it takes for information to go from its source to its destination, and concurrency providing a consistent quality of experience, regardless of the number of participants or where they're physically located. Bolton continued, Fortunately, we're at the beginning of the largest investment in broadband in history, with nearly $130 billion in state and federal subsidies that are being deployed. That funding will largely fund fiber projects that will deliver nearly unlimited broadband capacity and ultra-low latency. In any areas not built with fiber, the programs have minimum build requirements of 100 over 100 megabits per second or 100 over 20 megabits per second. He added, in short, the FCC's plan to move their definition of broadband from 25 over 3 megabits per second to 100 over 20 megabits per second is a moot point. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Imagine what somebody traveling in time from 1955, just imagine, you know, they, they look at the airplanes and they go, well, you know, uh, yeah, you, you know, you have jets now. We had some jets then, but uh, I see you've used jets and they're still pretty much the same. In fact, there's some airlines still flying planes from around that era. You know, and he, and he might look at our cars and say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, but some nice designs, but boy, I, I sure could drive one. I wouldn't have any trouble getting in the, getting in the car and driving it. Pedals in the same place, brakes in the same place, works pretty much the same. You got airbags? I don't know what those are, but they don't change how I use the thing. But then say, "Well, come here. Let me let me show you my TV." <laughs> and I think he'd feel like he'd entered the future, which he had. I mean, in 50 years, cars haven't changed that much. Airplanes haven't. A lot of our technology is pretty much the same. The incandescent light bulb, and then some of it's changed so much. We've gone from vinyl records to CDs. Our TVs are suddenly vivid and real and amazing. And he might not even be as amazed by the fact that you can get a little camcorder the size of your hand and shoot video that looks that good. You can edit it on this thing called a personal computer. That might amaze him. And do what? Put it on what's the Internet? Well, you see, you, you, you have this computer. Now, I think a computer you'd kind of get. It's just a shrunk version of you know, the IBM mainframe somebody from 1955 was used to. He'd kind of get the idea, well, oh, I see, you shrunk it down. I get, oh, it's color, that's pretty nice, it's very vivid looking, yeah. You use this pointer thing, this, this mouse, I see, it moves the arrow around, that's kind of neat. The keyboard, oh, I recognize that. <laughs> yep, that's the same one uh, Mrs. Marcos taught me to type on in, uh, in high school. Yeah, it hasn't changed. QWERTY, huh? You'd think in 50 years they'd come up with something better than that, huh? You'd recognize that, but boy, 
You say, well, see this video that I shot. See how vivid that is. I put that on this thing. I edited it down, put some titles on. Oh, that's pretty neat. It's like TV. Yeah, it's like TV. But then watch this. I press this button. It's now available instantly to anyone in the world with a similar computer and Internet connection. Oh, wow, wow that's pretty neat. How many people are there that, that can do that, he might ask? A thousand? That, that's pretty cool. We're not sure, but it's well over a billion. A billion? You're telling me you can shoot a video, edit it on this little version of a mainframe, and push a button, and a billion people can see it now? Yeah. Wow. That must change things a lot. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. What's that little thing on the on the desk there that's uh, hooked up to the computer? That little the glowing thing. What is that? That's a phone. Where's the dial? Oh, we don't have dials. You don't have dials? No, no, no. See, watch. I press this button that appears on the screen and you just touch it. Wow. Now, see, that probably, that iPhone probably looks more like Star Trek than anything else to this visitor, this mythical visitor from 1955. That's pretty amazing. Oh, and did I show you, you know, that video that we edited, put on the Internet a couple of seconds ago? Did I show you that I can play it back now on this phone anywhere? Uh-huh. Very interesting. That's what I love this business, and I love this beat. As a journalist, there's no more interesting beat. Nobody dies, nobody gets killed, but it's fun, it's interesting, and it's, it's important. It's not insignificant. Yeah, it's a toy store, but it's also changing things significantly, changing how we work, how we live, how we play. You want to really blow somebody's mind from 1955. Show them World of Warcraft. What's that? Well, it's a 3D world. I'm, 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 I'm uh, playing a game. You're in there? Oh, yeah. That's me. See the, the, the orc with the big axe? That's me. Well, no. What do you mean? That's you. Watch. And you walk around, you interact, you fight in a world that to somebody from 1955 must seem amazingly realistic. Now, by the way... What I didn't mention is that the rate of change from 1955 to now, 50 years ago to now, is double or tripled. So you're going to feel like that guy from 1955 in about 15, 20 years, maybe less, maybe 10. The same kinds of amazing jumps will happen to us. I can imagine going over to visit my grandkids in there. Oh, sorry. Little Leo's playing in the holodeck. He'll be out later. Wow. Ah, oh, let's. You know what would really change the world? You know what would really change the world? Here's from the Annals of Science. Are you ready for science? If we could figure out how to create power the same way the sun creates power, not nuclear fission, that's the stuff that atomic bombs and nuclear power plants these days are made of. And of course, that's a dirty technology, somewhat. Creates a nuclear waste that is dangerous to humans and other living things. Nuclear fusion is what the sun does. It takes hydrogen, of which there is a plentitude, fuses a few of them together, heavy, heavy hydrogen, and uh, forms helium, which, you know, just floats up <laughs> into the sky. Actually, we need helium. We're running low. Too many balloons, apparently. So, wouldn't it be cool if scientists could figure out how to create nuclear fusion? It would, if, if you could, if you could do it, it would effectively make uh, power free and pollution free, widely available. No more digging up old dinosaurs. It would be a, trans, a transformational thing. Well, they've made a very critical step. Researchers at Lawrence Livermore National Lab's National Ignition Facility, just up the road a piece. The National Ignition Facility, which is best known for igniting bombs. <laughs> I think they got the name, the NIF, when they were blowing things up. But they, but they also ignited the first fusion reaction a year ago. But they have now published the results in three peer-reviewed papers. Now, this isn't the step to cold fusion, which everybody talks about where we could actually use this. But it is a first step, a critical first step to creating a fusion reactor. Ignition during a fusion reaction means that the reaction produced enough energy to be self-sustaining. We've known how to make a fusion reaction to start it with a lot of energy and get a little out, but that's, <laughs> that's not going to produce anything of value. That's going to just use up energy. But they've now done it in such a way, I think it was, uh, I think uh, they, uh, they fired 100 megajoules. No, no. One, what is, I don't know what, they fired a little bit of, <laughs> a little, I can't, I don't know what they shot at it, a little bit of energy, and they got 1.3 megajoules 
Now, it was only lasted for, you know, a nanosecond. But just so you know, a megajoule is, no, is a non-trivial amount of energy. One megajoule is the kinetic energy of a ton mass moving at 100 miles an hour. Imagine a ton of something, like a, oh, I don't know, small vehicle, traveling at 100 miles an hour, hitting you. That's a lot of, <clears throat> that's a lot of energy. <clears throat> so this is huge. This is a big first step. Not the only step, but the big first step in creating fusion. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be amazing if sometime in our lifetime we could solve that and just energy would be plentiful and effectively free because there's plenty of hydrogen and pollution free too. Oh, that'd be so cool. We can dream. So from the annals of science, ignition. Now we just need liftoff. Big, big story. Uh, Q2, we've, you know, remember uh, last week we were talking a lot about uh, quarterly results from all the big tech companies and, you know, a mix of re results based, you know, a lot of problems from a variety of sources, not just supply chain problems, but inflation, recession, currency fluctuation, things like that. But one of the things now we've seen from the top seven U.S. cable companies, a first in the quarter ending in June, April, May, June, they lost broadband customers in that quarter. This is, I mean, for years, it's always been up, 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 more and more customers for cable broadband. For the first time ever last quarter, a negative, negative growth. Partly because Comcast, which is the number one internet service provider and cable company, was flat. No growth. Charter, number two, lost 21,000 customers. Altice, number three, 39,000 customers. So for the first time, anyone can remember cable operators lost market share in internet service. Don't worry too much about them. They're still 69.6% .6 of all internet service providers. They're still pretty dominant. But you know what? I don't think anybody is going to sigh and say, oh, too bad for the cable operator. Are they? I don't know. I don't think anybody's going to go, oh. Google's going to pay uh, a fine to Australia. I'm just giving you some of the top stories of the week. You, you understand? Just you know, just to give us a, something to talk about. Google uh, paying f a, kind of. You know what? This is a pittance for me. It'd be a lot of money for Google. It's not so much over uh, collecting data from Android phones because Google has said, and they say it here too, that oh, you just turn off the switch that says you know don't collect any location data and we'll stop, and they don't. So the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, mate, accused Google of making misleading representations to consumers about this and fined them, wow, a whopping 60 million Australian dollars, which about 43 million in real money. Not, that's, that's, I don't know, somebody should do the calculation, but I think Google, that's probably less than 10 minutes profit for Google. I don't think it's going to, it's not going to break the bank. So, but but you know what? Any any kind of spanking like this, uh, they pay attention. Maybe you shouldn't have done it, Google. You should have said, "Well, you can turn off location services, but we're gonna still know where you are, and we're gonna we're gonna keep track of that." Uh, let's see. And finally, NASA is sending an iPad to the moon. Wow, this seems to me somebody somebody paid for this. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to think the space launch system, Artemis One, is uh, is about to launch. Pretty, they haven't announced it yet, but it's like this month, right? Sometime, sometime soon. They're basically trying to prove that the rocket and the spacecraft can put people on uh, on the way to the moon. So they're going to send an uncrewed spacecraft, the Orion spacecraft, to the moon. But inside Orion will be something extra special: an iPad with Amazon's echo because somebody paid for this there's no way nasa thought this would be a good <laughs> oh we can't send astronauts to the moon without alexa they got to bring alexa with her so uh yeah they're gonna bring amazon's echo uh, technology oh and webex by cisco <laughs> okay now i know somebody paid for this howard who who howard who Deputy o, uh, Orion Program Manager, I almost read Onion, but it says Orion, yes, yeah. Deputy Orion Program Manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston says, I can imagine a future where astronauts can access information on flight status and telemetry 
through simple voice commands. Alexa, how hot is it going to be today on the moon? This, uh, somebody paid for this. Apple, Cisco, Amazon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here it is in the in the NASA blog post. The industry-funded payload. Yeah. No. Astronauts are not saying, how do I know what to wear today if I don't have my Amazon Echo to tell me? They're not saying that. It's an industry-funded payload. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1970. The amateur population is 250,000, but stagnant. The license fees and incentive licensing are blamed. Meanwhile, 2-meter FM is starting to boom. New equipment designed for the amateur market joins the surplus wideband commercial radios which were converted for use on 146.94. Megahertz and kilohertz replace megacycles and kilocycles. And amateur radio is dragged into the Vietnam War protest movement with a student information net operating on college campuses nationwide. 1971. The Japanese are starting to dominate the amateur markets. National, Hammerland, Helicrafters, and Gonset were beginning to fade away, but Drake, Tentec, Heathkit, and Collins were still going strong. 1972. A national 2-meter FM band plan was announced. 146.52 was chosen as the national simplex frequency. The FCC released the first repeater rules expanded the technician 2-meter allocation to 145 through 148 MHz and relaxed mobile logging requirements. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. In Brooklyn, New York, a marketer of wireless microphones has been fined nearly $700,000 by the U.S. Federal Communications Commission for what the regulating agency said is a decade-long practice of selling these devices which are not RF compliant. The FCC said that 32 models of microphone sold by the company Sound Around failed to comply with FCC requirements governing emissions power and use of the spectrum, rules that protect against harmful interference to other spectrum users. The FCC has rejected the business's assertion that the large amount of the proposed fine was too high, that a decade of warnings and notices sent by the FCC was insufficient notice, and that photos on the company's marketing websites did not provide proof that the items were actually available for purchase. According to a press release from the FCC, the US Department of Justice will be given the case to handle if Sound Around fails to pay the fine. A forensic analysis of the collapse of the Arecibo radio telescope in 2021 has concluded that the problems in both the suspension cables and the socket that held them led to the failures that precipitated the collapse. The detailed study by engineering firm of Thornton Tomasetti reported that a combination of five major factors was responsible. They are number one, the manual and inconsistent splay of the wires during cable socketing. Number two, the design of the cable system with relatively low safety factors. Number three, the occurrence of extreme environmental events such as hurricanes and earthquakes. Number four, the non-replacement repair or bypass of the sockets where large cable slips were observed. And number five, the addition of auxiliary cables as isolated cables. The report concluded that while further study is needed to determine the service life of cable socket assemblies, the risk of socket failure can be mitigated by number one, controlling the number and geometry of splayed out wires during cable socketing, number two and three, designing cable systems with larger safety factors under gravity and transient loads, 
Number four, monitoring the cable slip and slip rate after cable installation. And number five, designing cable systems with multiple adjacent cables on each span. Amateurs in France will need to share many of their frequencies with broadcasters and others involved in the upcoming Paris 2024 Olympic Games. Just as some amateur frequencies were open to other users during the Olympics in London in 2012, Amateur frequencies are to be shared during the 2024 Olympics in France. According to recent news reports, some VHF and UHF frequencies are to become available between June 26th and September 15th of 2024 to accommodate the organizing committee for the Paris Games, thus requiring amateur radio operators to limit their activities on those bands. The National Frequency Agency of France, which is responsible for allocations in that country, said frequencies are being made available during the games for private mobile voice communications, mostly by walkie-talkie. Amateur radio operators are considered primary users on two meters by International Telecommunications Union. On other bands, 1240 MHz to 1260 MHz will be used for program making and special events, or PMSE services. These frequencies are open to hams on a secondary basis. Frequencies in the 2.3 GHz band, also open to hams on a secondary basis, will be used for video links. Trending in incidents, events, activations, and exercises these past few years has been their administration under the Incident Command System. Two months ago, a club in rural northern Florida conducted its field day under the system with an incident commander and assistance for safety, liaison, and public information, and chiefs for operations, finance and administration, logistics, and planning. This system translated into a winning scenario for the club, scores proved it, the county sheriff and emergency manager made appearances, and safety was the primary concern with no incidents noted. Traditionally, the system is used by public agencies to manage emergencies, but the ICS can also be used by businesses and many other entities, including ARIES, as an administration model. ARIES emergency coordinators and members can become familiar with the fundamental concepts of incident command and coordinate planning with local public emergencies services accordingly. The use of the incident command system by an ARIES group, or any group for that matter, depends upon the size and complexity of the incident or event. Functions and roles may be assigned to multiple individuals, or a few persons may be assigned multiple responsibilities. Not all of the ICS positions need to be activated in each incident. The ICS structure is meant to expand and contract as the scope of the incident requires. For small-scale incidents, only the incident commander may be assigned. Command of an incident would likely transfer to the senior on-scene officer of the responding public agency when emergency services arrive on the scene. For an amateur radio exercise, such as the ARRL simulated emergency test, the emergency coordinator could, for example, assume the title of incident commander or communications unit leader and rank-and-file ARIES members can assume other roles in the communications unit. The communications unit, a critical function within the logistics section, is designed to support the operable and interoperable communications needs for planned events, unplanned events, and exercises. Key communications unit positions that can be assigned to ARIES members in the SET include communications unit leader, Incident Communications Center Manager, Communications Technician, Incident Technical Dispatcher, Radio Operator, and IT Service Unit Leader. The ARRL Simulated Emergency Test Weekend is October 1st and 2nd this year, but groups are free to conduct their local and section-wide exercises at any time throughout the fall. The annual SET encourages maximum participation by all amateur radio operators, partner organizations, and national, state, and local officials who typically engage in emergency or disaster response. In addition to ARIES volunteers, radio amateurs active in the national traffic system, radio amateur civil emergency service, Skywarn, community emergency response teams, 
and a variety of other allied groups and public service-oriented radio amateurs are needed to fulfill important roles in this nationwide exercise. The SET allows volunteers to test equipment, modes, and skills under simulated emergency conditions and scenarios. Individuals can use the time to update a GO kit for use during deployments and to ensure their home station's operational capability in an emergency or disaster. To get involved, contact your local ARRL emergency coordinator or net manager. Check on upcoming planned activities through local, state, or section-wide nets. Consider developing your group's SET plan by using the Department of Homeland Security's Exercise and Evaluation Program. Exercises are a key component of national preparedness. They provide the whole community with the opportunity to shape planning, assess and validate capabilities, and address areas for improvement. As an example, this year's SET in Florida is titled Service Denied with the scenario of a statewide cyber attack that impacts the state's communications infrastructure. While Ares teams based in Florida are accustomed to hurricane activations, a cyber attack has just as much chance of occurring with even less notice, if any, than a hurricane. The slogan we all see, when all else fails, ham radio works, would truly pick up its real meaning with a full communications infrastructure outage. We have begun working with our served agencies and other partner organizations to get engagement for participation, said Northern Florida Section Emergency Coordinator Arc Thames, W4CPD. Communicators from the Florida Department of Emergency Management will be participating in this exercise from the state EOC in Tallahassee, so this provides an excellent opportunity for a county, volunteer organization, or agency to test their communications ability with the state and other agencies throughout the state. All three ARRL sections are planning to make this a true statewide exercise. Foundations of Amateur Radio The American Radio Relay League, or ARRL, is one of the oldest amateur associations on Earth. 1926 saw the birth of the Radio Amateurs Handbook, the first edition of what we now know as the ARRL Handbook for Radio Communications featured chapters on what it means to be an amateur, how to build and operate a station, how propagation works, and how to experiment. The very first handbook had 5,000 copies printed, and thanks to the website worldradiohistory.com, we have access to a signed copy by the author himself, the communications manager of the ARRL, Francis Edward Handy, Whiskey One, Bravo, Delta, India. He starts the 228-page book with the following words. This handbook is written as a guide for member operators of the League. It is also useful as a source of information to the man who wants to take part in amateur radio activity, but who has no idea of how to get started. Written first of all for the beginner, such an amount of useful and up-to-date information has been added that the handbook in its present form is equally valuable as a compendium of information for the experienced brass pounder and the beginner alike. The first edition doesn't show a cover price, but the third edition, published a year later, shows a charge of one dollar. The 2022, or 99th edition, has nearly six times as many pages, 1,280 of them. It costs 10 times as much per page and sells for nearly 50 times as much, at 49.95. The current handbook features topics such as radio electronics theory and principles, circuit design and equipment, as well as articles and projects that include 3D printing, portable battery selection, safe antenna and tower work practices, and comes in a variety of formats, including electronic and box sets. I'm giving this background to give you a sense of how things have evolved in the past century. For example, one thing that the very first edition didn't have was a page called the Amateur's Code. The oldest copy I found appears in the 1927 or third edition. If you're familiar with the words, you're in for a treat. If not, sit back and imagine it's 1927, or 1923, more on that in a moment. The Amateur's Code 1. The amateur is gentlemanly, 
He never knowingly uses the air for his own amusement in such a way as to lessen the pleasure of others. He abides by the pledges given by the ARRL in his behalf to the public and the government. 2. The amateur is loyal. He owes his amateur radio to the American Radio Relay League and he offers it his unswerving loyalty. 3. The amateur is progressive. He keeps his station abreast of science. It is billed well and efficiently. His operating practice is clean and regular. 4. The amateur is friendly, slow and patient sending when requested, friendly advice and counsel to the beginner, kindly assistance and cooperation for the broadcast listener. These are the marks of the amateur spirit. 5. The amateur is balanced. Radio is his hobby. He never allows it to interfere with any of the duties he owes to his home, his job, his school or his community. 6. The amateur is patriotic. His knowledge and his station are always ready for the service of his country and his community. This version is credited to Paul M. Segal, 9 Echo Echo Alpha, Director, Rocky Mountain Division, ARRL. The code appears on page 9 of the 1927 edition of the handbook. It uses Roman numerals to identify each point. The title is beautifully rendered with the old English typeface, and is shown inside a rectangle on a page on its own. Over the next 45 years, the text stays the same. There are changes like colons to semicolons, an additional comma, and the evolution from Roman numerals to modern numbers, and then written numbers, and finally the removal of the numbers entirely. At one point, the title is changed from Amateur's Code to Our Code, but that only lasts for one edition. Speaking of editions, the 1936 edition, the 13th in the series, is referred throughout as the 1936 edition, Superstition is Alive and Well. The credits changes over time as well. In 1929, Paul's call sign is changed from 9 Echo Echo Alpha to Whiskey 9 Echo Echo Alpha. In 1943, we see a once-off credit appear. It states that the code was written in 1923 by Lieutenant Commander Paul M. Segal, General Counsel of ARRL. It's the only credit that shows a different year from any of the other references, which all point at 1928 as the original year, which is what the ARRL uses today. Interestingly, we have a copy of the handbook from 1927 that features the code, so it's entirely possible that 1923 is actually correct, and it's not hard to imagine that a poorly printed 3 looks like the remains of the number 8. To add to this, there's a 1944 FCC report to the President of the United States of America that contains a reference to Lieutenant Commander Paul M. Segal, the radio industry attorney. In addition, there's an announcement in the New York Times, dated 25 May 1968, with the headline, Paul M. Segal is dead at 68, expert in communications law. I don't have access to any version of the second edition of the handbook, which had two print runs in 1927. It's entirely possible that the code appeared there, but I have no evidence either way. I do believe that Paul M. Segal, 9 Echo Echo Alpha, director of the Rocky Mountain Division of the ARRL, is the same person as Lieutenant Commander Paul M. Segal, general counsel of ARRL, and radio industry attorney, who became a silent key in 1968. Credits, layout and font changes aside, 1973 sees the first time when the words of the Amateur's Code actually change. Let me illustrate. The original first clause reads, 1. The Amateur is gentlemanly. He never knowingly uses the air for his own amusement in such a way as to lessen the pleasure of others. He abides by the pledges given by the ARRL in his behalf to the public and the government. In 1973, that's changed to... 1. The amateur is considerate. He never knowingly uses the air in such a way as to lessen the pleasure of others. 
the first four clauses are modified to greater and lesser degree. Clause 5 and 6 stay the same. Today, the ARRL website shows the first clause as The radio amateur is considerate. He, she never knowingly operates in such a way as to lessen the pleasure of others. And the credit reads Adapted from the original Amateur's Code written by Paul M. Segal, Whiskey 9, Echo Echo Alpha in 1928. It's noteworthy that, going back to the original text, the very first clause encourages the amateur to be gentlemanly, something which we can relate to in terms of being respectful, polite, and civil. It's also clear that the Amateur's Code is a living document, and has been moving with the times. I think that we as a community have the opportunity to participate in another review, and I will investigate and share with you some of my thoughts on the matter. I think that it is important that we have a code of conduct that reflects our values, and at present the best starting point we have is the Amateur's Code. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Young Amateurs Radio Club will host their first annual Youth Organized Special Event from September 1st through the 15th using their call sign WY4RC. The event is known as Worked All YARC Zones. Operators will be activating WY4RC stations from all 10 U.S. call zones. Different awards are available for youth operators who activate a station and for those who contact at least six WY4RC stations. This is the club's inaugural Worked All Zones event and organizers are looking for young operators or other clubs who would like to join them on the air activating the call sign in September. Operators must use a minimum of 20 watts during the event. Any young amateur or club interested in operating during the event can find the rules and additional information at the Young Amateur Radio Club website, yarc.world. Young Amateurs Radio Club, founded in 2017, is an international amateur radio club with a focus on promoting adoption and innovation in amateur radio among young people. In 2018, the club was officially recognized by the FCC as an official amateur radio club under the call sign WY4RC. YARC has over 1,000 members on their Discord server as of 2022 and has been changing its structure to bring back community events and increase engagement. ARL has introduced the third edition of Get on the Air with HF Digital by Steve Ford, WB8IMY. The book written in an easy-to-understand style. It covers how to set up and operate your own HF digital station. Ford includes the details for making contacts using 11 different digital modes, including the Pactor system, as well as signal WSJT-X modes, VARA, and JS8 call. Join the millions of amateur radio operators worldwide studying propagation with WSPR, contesting with RIDI, and rag-chewing with the JS8 call. You can order your copy from ARRL and ARRL Publication Dealers. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that at 2334 UTC on August 17th, the Australian Space Forecast Center issued a geomagnetic disturbance warning. Periods of G1 conditions are expected during August 19th and 20th due to the combination of coronal hole high-speed wind streams and several coronal mass ejections observed in the last few days. There is a chance of isolated periods of G2 over August 19th and 20th. Local TV newscasts around the country reported on the possibility of aurora last week on Thursday night, although observers would need to travel to dark areas away from their city for any chance of successful viewing. They recommended using a tripod-mounted camera ported north with a long exposure time. This is good advice as often the dramatic aurora photos are done this way and viewing with the naked eye, you see a much less dramatic image. Last week, we noted increased solar activity, and it did continue. Average daily sunspot numbers increased from 36.6 to 65.4 last week to 95.6 in the current reporting period, August 11th to the 17th. Average daily solar flux went from 94.7 to 111.9 last week and 123.7 this week. But solar flux values have pulled back in recent days with a peak of 134.3 at 1700 UTC on August 15th 
followed by the standard 2000 UTC local noon readings of 128.5, 122.7, and 116.5 on August 16th to the 18th. So let's take a quick look ahead as the predicted solar flux will be 120 on August 20th, 115 on August 21st through the 23rd, 110 and 95 on August 24th through the 25th, 94 on August 26th through the 27th, and 96, 98, 100, 108, and 114 on August 28th through September 1st. Taking a quick look at the Planetary A Index now, it is predicted to be 8 on August 21st, 5 on August 22nd through the 26th, 12 on August 27th, 8 on August 28th through the 30th, and 5 on August 31st through September 2nd. Radio Sport Contesting, many opportunities are available for you. On August 19th, it's the QRP Fox Hunt, that's CW. August 20th through the 21st, the SARTG WWV RIDI Contest, that's digital. August 20th through the 21st, the ARRL 10, hertz, uh, 10 gigahertz and up contest, CW phone and digital. August 20th, that's the uh, Feld Hell Sprint, that's digital. August 20th through the 21st, the North American QSO Party, single sideband. August 21st, the SARL High Frequency Digital Contest, digital there. On August 21st, the ARRL Rookie Roundup, that's RTTY, digital. On August 21st through the 22nd, the Run for the Bacon QRP Contest, that's CW. And August 23rd, Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest, that's on phone. And August 24th, the SKCC Sprint, CW. And on August 24th, the Phone Weekly Test, that of course is phone. And some upcoming section, state, and division conventions that you might want to know about. On August 20th through the 21st, it's the Huntsville Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Southeastern Division Convention. That's in Huntsville, Alabama. August 26th through the 28th, the Northeast Ham Exposition, hosting the ARRL New England and Hudson Division Convention. That's in Marlboro, Massachusetts. On September 2nd through the 4th, the Shelby Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Carolina Section Convention. That's in Shelby, North Carolina. September 9th through the 10th, the Queen Wilhelmina Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Arkansas State Convention in Mena, Arkansas. On September 11th, the ARRL Southern New Jersey Session Convention, Malika Hill, New Jersey. September 17th through the 18th, it's the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. That's an online event, and ARRL is a QSO Today partner. From September 23rd through the 24th, it's the HRO Superfest hosting the ARRL Central Division Convention. That's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This coming weekend, the 20th and 21st of August, is a great opportunity to chat to a lighthouse or lightship and work some rare DX. There'll be around 500 lighthouses and lightships on the air in over 40 countries. Germany has registered 70 stations, the USA 41, Australia 38 and the UK 19. Some smaller countries with one entry are the Canary Islands, Cyprus, Gibraltar, Iceland, Latvia and Malta. The International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend ILLW, came into being in 1998 as the Scottish Northern Lights Award run by the Air Amateur Radio Group. The whole history of this event can be found at their website illw.net. It is one of the most popular international amateur radio events in existence, probably because there are very few rules and it's not the usual contest type of event. It is also free and there are no prizes for contacting large numbers of other stations. There's little doubt that the month of August has become Lighthouse Month, due largely to the popularity and growth of the ILLW. As this will be the 25th anniversary of the event, one Indian supporter has organised a set of first-day cover postage stamps to be printed. After the event, there will also be a 25th anniversary certificate available for download from the ILLW website for those who would like to have a record of their participation in the event. It's interesting to note that some stations have taken part in the event every year, some with the same call sign and some at the same lighthouse. It is the support of amateurs globally that has grown this event into what it has become, one of the most popular events in the amateur radio calendar. John Cunliffe, Golf 6 Lima November Victor, chair of the Humber Fortress Amateur Radio Club, tells us that the club is proud to have been invited back to Spurn Point Lighthouse by the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust for the 25th International Lighthouse on the Air event on Saturday the 20th of August and Sunday the 21st of August 2022. 
This is a very special place to operate from. Dark skies, low electrical interference, with salt water only a dozen yards away on two sides. The estimated first transmission from the station should be at 10.30 hours UTC on the Saturday. Listen out for their special call, Golf Bravo 2 Sierra Lima on the airwaves. The operation is from the Little Works Locator Square of Juliet Oscar 03 Bravo November. That equates to Work Tool Britain Square Tango Alpha 41. Full details of this operation can be found at www.hfdxarc.com. The Trinidad and Tobago Amateur Radio Society, known as TTARS, will celebrate the Trinidad and Tobago's 60th anniversary of independence on August 26th through September 2nd, 2022. A special event call sign 9Y60TT will operate multi-mode, multi-band, and multi-operator. The modes will include just about everything. HF single sideband, CW, slow scan TV, FT8, JS8, FT4, JT65, and 2 meter EME satellite. Also automatic packeting reporting system, that's APRS via the International Space Station. Digital voice, DMR, and Echo Link, and much more. QSL is available via the Logbook of the World. For more information on the event and to obtain a certificate, visit their website at TTARS. On Tuesday, August the 16th, BBC Television's Josie Hannett interviewed eight-year-old Isabella Payne about her amateur radio contact with NASA astronaut Kel Lindgren, Kilo Oscar 5 Mike Oscar Sierra, who is currently operating from the International Space Station. Earlier in the month, on August the 2nd, Isabella, a member of the Hilderstone Radio Society, used her dad's amateur radio station, Mike Zero Lima Mike Kilo, to make contact with Kel, who was using the ISS amateur station, callsign November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra. Isabella has been involved in several amateur radio events and hopes to have her own amateur radio license soon. The BBC news item was broadcast on the programme South East Today at 18.30 on Tuesday, August the 16th. You can watch the interview on the BBC iPlayer. Just fast forward to about 15 minutes into the show at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash iPlayer and then select the correct episode. The BBC covered the story in the local Kent section on its website, and Isabella was also interviewed both on Radio 5 Live and on BBC Radio Kent. There's been a fair bit of press coverage of the eight-year-old's ISS ham radio contact. For example, look at the information at amsat-uk.org. And Kiel himself described the contact as his favourite ham radio contact so far from the International Space Station. BBC South East described the contact as a dream come true for eight-year-old Isabella. Rice University in Houston, Texas is offering a new class entitled Physics of Ham Radio. The class is primarily aimed at teachers, but Rice undergraduates and postgrads are also welcome. Classes will meet in person, but virtual participation is possible by request. The class teaches the basics of electromagnetic waves, simple circuit and antenna theory, radio propagation, GPS theory and operation, the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, and space weather. The midterm is the Technician Class Amateur Radio Service License Exam. The second half of the course covers GPS and space weather topics, along with one general electrical circuit lab and safe solar eclipse observation technique. The class is taught by Professor Patricia Reef, W5TAR, and will use the fifth edition of the ARRL Handbook Radio License Manual. The cost of three hours of academic credit is $1,200, discounted from $8,900, or for professional development hours only $150. Some partial scholarships for academic credit versions are available thanks to NASA's HEAT program. For detailed information, visit the Weiss School of Natural Sciences, and for questions, contact Dr. Reef at Rice University. Here is this week's AMSAT update from Boost Page, KK5DO, and this interesting anomaly happens every now and then. We have RS-44 that is operational all of the time, and then we have FO-29 that is on a schedule due to issues with its batteries. The satellites were launched many years apart, however, like everything that orbits the Earth, their paths may coincide now and then, as is the case in the present time. 
So what effect does this have? Well, some that is working RS-44 with an uplink on 145.935, 145.995, will be heard on the downlink of 435.640. And that sounds good so far. FO29 has uplink on 145.900, 146, and will be heard on 435.850. Well, as you can see, the uplinks are nearly identical. However, the downlinks are different. So to temporarily resolve the issue, it's a good practice to call your CQ and say the satellite such as CQ, CQ, RS44, and then your call sign, or CQ, CQ, FO29, and then your call sign. This happened a long time ago when we discovered that the A07 satellite uh, was interfering with the downlink from another satellite. And that's how we found A07 had come back to life after a long nap. The Holmesburg Amateur Radio Club in Philadelphia decided to send its club call, WM3PEN, on a long vacation that would take 255 days to get there. They teamed up with NASA's Mars Science Laboratory rover Curiosity to visit Bradbury Landing on Mars. The boarding pass was purchased on April 25, 2011, and Curiosity, with their call sign on board, landed on the Red Planet in early August 2012. Since the landing, Curiosity and WM3PEN have traveled nearly 18 miles searching for the perfect location for the de-expedition. The folks at WM3PEN also thought it would be a good trip to team up with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since they decided to make it a CW event. To help measure size and distance, the JPL engineers carved out the dots and dashes of the letters JPL in the tire treads. How could a ham argue with a CW buddy along for the ride? NASA reports that engineers are devising ways to minimize wear and tear and keep their rover rolling. In fact, Curiosity's mission was recently extended for another three years. When asked what's next for the WM3PEN team, call sign trustee Bob Josuate, WA3PZO, said that after just coming off field day and the 13 Colonies special event in June and July, it will be time to relax before planning the next adventure. As an aside, most of the news anchors and behind-the-scenes folks here at This Week in Amateur Radio also have their names and call signs on the Curiosity rover, as well as the Parker Solar Probe. On the Go Get Funding website, Roly Zulu Lima 1 Bravo Quebec Delta describes his aim of getting new people licensed as amateur radio operators in the many nations in the Pacific region that currently have few or no radio amateurs. Roly does a lot of travelling throughout the Pacific Islands, fixing and maintaining FM broadcast stations. A lot of them are mission type stations, but there are a fair number of commercial stations in the mix as well. When he's at an island location, he also operates as a one-man de-expedition in his spare time, of which he says there is an abundance. To date, he's activated 28 countries over 35 de-expeditions. It has long been Rowley's ambition to train up one or two indigenous people in the countries he visits, and to try to get them through exams to achieve a ham radio licence. In many of the island locations, these individuals would be the first and only indigenous people to hold a ham radio license. As an example, Rowley described a guy called Isaac, who lives in Papua New Guinea. Isaac is almost at the stage of being able to get a license. He is typical of the challenges involved in Rowley's project. Isaac heard on the local mission radio that help was needed at the station, so he walked from his very remote village about 25 miles away to the station, dressed in his best loincloth and carrying his sharpest machete, ready to help out. Well, Isaac was not really what the station was looking for in an announcer, but they said he could stay on at the compound and look after the property. So he cut the grass with his machete and kept the grounds looking beautiful. As time went on, the station receptionist decided she simply couldn't turn up to work one day. So when the phone started ringing, Isaac answered it and simply mimicked what he'd heard the receptionist saying. 
As time went by, the main on-air announcer also decided to go bush, so Isaac sat down in front of the mic and started speaking, as he'd observed over several months. He did this from 6am to midnight every day for about three months, until Rowley turned up and found out that the transmitter had been turned off the whole time. So poor Isaac had been speaking only to himself through the mixing desk into his headphones. Isaac had only a very rudimentary primary school education, but he was a quick, good learner and very capable. He had been invaluable in keeping two one kilowatt FM stations on the air, he on one end and Rolly on the other end of video links, sorting things out. Isaac is one of the guys that Rolly is training up for the ham radio license, and he's just about there. So how can you help? Rowley is currently fundraising to get Isaac an IC7300 amateur radio transceiver. The guys have already installed antennas, a DX Commander Classic and a selection of dipoles slung up into the coconut trees. Isaac currently has a small Sony receiver and listens in to the handbands, getting used to the procedures and the jargon. This Papua New Guinea project is the first test run for projects in other places around the Pacific. Rowley says that the Solomon Islands is next on his list. None of the local indigenous population would ever in a million years be able to afford the likes of an IC7300 when they are subsistence living and earn only cents per hour. So Rowley is seeking to raise at least $5,000 to get his first project underway. He needs to arrange a small solar power system capable of running the ham radio station. And then there is the high cost of freight to deal with. Rolly, Zulu Lima 1 Bravo Quebec Delta, says that if you would like to donate, go to gogetfunding.com forward slash ham radio for Papua New Guinea. And that's all hyphenated, ham radio for Papua New Guinea. The Finnish Amateur Radio Association has recognized that even amateurs who don't operate with the digital modes might still want to go digital when it comes to reading material about radio. The SRAL now allows its members the option of receiving their magazines in a digital format sent via email instead of waiting for the postal carrier to deliver it. This follows the lead of a number of amateur radio societies around the world who have recently made that shift, including the ARRL in the United States with its QST and On the Air magazines and the Radio Society of Great Britain with RADCOM. Members of the Finnish Society are being given the option of receiving both the paper and digital edition. An SRAL survey of members showed that 37% of association members were strongly interested in a digital publication. That bodes well for the society's budget, as digital distribution is expected to reduce costs of producing the magazine, which the association considers one of its biggest expenses. Debris from a Russian anti-satellite weapon demonstration that caused squalls of close approaches to satellites earlier this year is now affecting a new series of Starlink satellites. During a presentation at a Secure World Foundation event, during the small satellite conference held on August 8th, Dan Altridge, chief scientist at Comspach, said his company found a conjunction squall affecting Starlink satellites, with a spike in the number of close approaches of debris from the former Cosmos 1408 satellite. That debris, created when a Russian direct ascent, ASAT destroyed Cosmos 1408 in a November 2021 test, is in an orbit that lines up with satellites in sun-synchronous orbit. Kamsbach found earlier this year that this created surges of close approaches, or conjunctions, as the satellites run head-on into the debris. In a recent event on August 6th, Outrage said there were more than 6,000 close approaches, defined as being within 10 kilometers, involving 841 Starlink satellites, about 30% of the constellation. It's unclear how many, if any, of the satellites had to maneuver to avoid collisions. This conjunction squall was exacerbated by a new group of Starlink satellites. SpaceX launched the first set of Group 3 Starlink satellites July 10th from Vandenberg Space Force Base into polar orbit, followed by a second set July 22nd. A third batch of Group 3 satellites is scheduled to launch this week. SpaceX has long emphasized the ability of its Starlink satellites 
to autonomously maneuver to avoid conjunctions. The company said that between December 2021 and May 2022, Starlink satellites performed nearly 7,000 collision avoidance maneuvers, of which 1,700 were linked to Russian ASAT debris. While SpaceX may be able to manage these conjunctions with its technology, it may be more difficult for other operators of satellites' constellations. If you didn't have that automated system taking care of a spike like this, it could be really challenging to work it, though, Atraj said. Those conjunction squalls will subside over time as the debris decays. However, Atraj said that may only shift the risk to other orbits, notably the International Space Station. It's going to put ISS and others at risk. Younger adults in the UK now watch almost seven times less scheduled television than those aged 65 and over, the regulator Ofcom has found, as the generation gap in media habits reaches a record high. People aged 16 to 24 spend less than an hour, just 53 minutes in fact, in front of broadcast television in an average day, a fall of two thirds in the last 10 years. In contrast, those aged 65 and over still spend around a third of their waking day enjoying broadcast television, sitting down in front of the telly on average for almost six hours daily. Around a fifth of homes, that's 5.2 million, now subscribe to all three of the most popular streaming platforms, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video and Disney Plus, with the subscriptions to all three costing around £300 a year. While public service broadcasters have continued to see both audiences and levels of viewing fall, there is better news for their on-demand player apps. The average time spent watching services such as BBC iPlayer, ITV Hub and All4 increased to 15 minutes per day, up by 3 minutes per person per day, bucking the trend of post-pandemic declines in viewing time. 9 in 10 18 to 24 year old adults bypass television channels and head straight to streaming or on demand and social video services when looking for something to watch, with Netflix currently the most common destination. However, 6 in 10 55 to 64 year olds and three quarters of those aged 65 plus still turn to TV channels first. Ian McRae, Ofcom's Director of Market Intelligence, said that traditional broadcasters face tough competition from online streaming platforms, which they're partly meeting through the popularity of their own on-demand player apps, while broadcast television is still the place to go for big events that bring the nation together, such as the Women's European Football Final or the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. Viewing figures of more than 10 million for the Women's Euro 22 Final and the Queen's Platinum Jubilee show that broadcast television is still a popular choice for momentous national events, but public service broadcasters continue to see both audiences and levels of viewing fall. An Ofcom news release with more details about these findings is also available at www.ofcom.org.uk forward slash news hyphen center. In true amateur radio spirit, the learning hasn't stopped for Arden Nelson, KA9, WAR. He trained to fly military aircraft in the Army Air Corps during World War II and 79 years ago this month, he soloed a PT-19 in Ballinger, Texas. He also learned to communicate using CW, although he regrets not having stayed with that mode when he became an amateur radio operator 37 years ago. Arden, who turned 100 years old on July 2nd, hasn't avoided conquering other modes since then. He devotes three to four hours a day listening to the radio and trying to score some good DX. He said that with the assistance of Dwight NS9I, he made the leap into the digital realm and is active now making contacts using FT8. Few hams could have been happier recently than Lou and 2 cyy who logged an FT8 contact with him in his New Jersey shack on August 13th. He was happy to learn his new friend had recently become a centenarian. Even without making radio contact with them, however, other local hams are sharing that joy. Fellow members of the Marinette and Menominee Amateur Radio Club honored Arden recently with a birthday celebration and a picnic at a local park.
Veron, the representative body for amateur radio in the Netherlands, reports that a 144 megahertz bicycle mobile competition will take place during this year's German Dutch Amateur Radio Days event. It will not have escaped many people's attention that from August the 25th to the 28th, this event called the DNAT, the DNAT, will be organized again. But did you also know that the organization is once again offering a bicycle mobile competition this year? This special competition starts on Saturday, August the 27th at 10.30 a.m. local time. Suitably equipped bicycles will depart from the DNAT campsite, Ambada Park. For additional information, such as the rules, frequently asked questions, proposed route and log sheets, seek out dnat.de forward slash mobile contest. Mobile is without an E. So, take your bike to Bard Bentheim to participate in this bicycle mobile contest. During the competition, radio amateurs will operate on the 144 MHz or 2 meter wavelength band. Fortunately, no long wire antennas between two bicycles is permitted, so there's no health and safety worries on that front. You can also find out more from the Veron website, tinyurl.com forward slash iaru hyphen Netherlands. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In the last four segments on promoting your not-for-profit ham radio club's events, we created a public service announcement and gathered names and addresses of local media outlets, we discussed other places to post your event flyers and where to mail your PSAs. This time we'll cover some of the realities of free promotions in these days of media conglomeration and downsizing. In the good old days of broadcast radio, even the boss's secretary had a secretary. Today, radio and TV stations often operate on skeleton crews. Computers playing wave files or commanding a stack of CD changers take the place of live on the air talent. At stations which once employed 15 people now operate on five or so with many jobs contracted out or supplied by out of state ownership. This sad but real state of broadcasting has a direct effect on your ability to promote your nonprofit club's event. They simply do not have the manpower to research, verify, or prep your PSA for air. This is all the more reason why it must be ready to use as is when it arrives at the radio station. The more you do to make it ready for them, the more likely it is to be put on the air. The professional appearing PSA is also more likely to be read as is if it looks right too. If there is a fatal flaw in any of the important features in your PSA, it is always easier for the person who actually reads it on the air to simply use the next one instead. A traditional item in the broadcast studio is the PSA folder. This three ring folder usually sits right in front of the announcer and not only contains your PSA, but also other information for the DJ. Radio stations usually use a three ring folder with clear plastic sleeves. The announcer's time is scarce, so your PSA needs to be short, easy to read as is. It must not contain any grammar or spelling mistakes, should be double spaced, and the portion to be read on the air should be visibly obvious to the reader in an instant. An example of this would be that in your PSA, the portion to be actually read on the air should be the only area on that page which is in bold text and double spaced so it jumps out at the reader. Another trick is to use colored paper, but not the neon-like color. If all the pages in the PSA folder are white except yours, which is canary yellow, it makes it easier for the announcer to flip through the PSA folder to that page next time. You could put your PSA into a clear plastic sleeve and mail it to the radio station too. Never send a media outlet a handwritten PSA or ones that contain spelling and grammar mistakes, and always include contact information. Your club should designate a main contact person who has all the access to all the pertinent information about what is mentioned in your PSA and background information about your club, especially its nonprofit status. Retired people make the best contacts since they are usually easy to get a hold of during business hours. And my final strategy for promotional success is if your club has a good speaker, 
record your PSA into a solid 30-second recording and burn it onto a CD and mail it to the radio stations on your list. Again, include some free admission tickets and provide a hard copy of the PSA, which is on the CD. This is the ultimate lazy but most successful approach to promotional success. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox 9 Mike Papa, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, researchers believe they have found a means of building smaller capacitors, allowing for some electronic devices to be greatly miniaturized. The IEEE Spectrum reports that scientists are saying these capacitors could even be as small as one hundredth the size of many of the ones presently in use. They are creating them with materials they call super lattices, and they're made from materials that mimic antiferroelectrics. Antiferroelectrics are important because they have positive and negative poles, electric dipoles, pointing in opposite directions, creating zero electric polarization. Exposed to an electric field having sufficient strength, antiferroelectrics can become highly polarized, which results in the large energy densities needed. Because there are a few antiferroelectric materials that occur naturally, scientists have created and used artificial ones. Researchers reported in the journal Science that their work with the super lattices shows promise for working on a much smaller scale. Their ability for energy storage is 100 times greater than conventional capacitors. Physicists believe they will someday be used to create these ultra-tiny capacitors. Physicist Hugo Arambari of the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology said it would be interesting to measure other properties like how much voltage they can withstand, their endurance in long-term use, and ultimately, commercial viability. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you